the log. I'm Charles Purcell here in our brand new studios, which <laughs> we just moved. If uh, if you didn't know, yeah, brand new studios. Uh, I'm sitting among boxes and <laughs> oh, it's a mess. It's a big old mess. Don't you just love moving? Yeah, move the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel. My home and my home studio. And the home studio really is <laughs> the uh, dominant feature of my home. Uh, so, uh, good to talk to you. I haven't talked to you since last Thursday. And I've had quite an eventful long weekend since then. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm openly looking for your empathy, your sympathy. Moving day turned into moving days. So, of course, I set the uh, studio up first, the, the basics, just what I need, just to talk to you today. And that's mostly all that's done. I've got a few other things completed. But, uh, yeah, you know, you know what it looks like when you move. It's just boxes and things out of place, furniture not arranged, rugs rolled up. I, uh, I've said this many times, but... <laughs> I want to be a minimalist. I believe in minimalism. But then when I get right down to looking at my actual life, I see that I'm failing. But, I, you know, I do have to say most of it, well, most of it's necessary. Am I rationalizing now? It's a lot of paperwork, I have to admit, that I don't want to get rid of from the past. Files on shows and projects over the years, over the decades. I can't bring myself to get rid of. So they're those kinds of crates probably have way more equipment than I need, especially when it comes to the small stuff, the patch cords, the little mixers and splicers and, and the cables. Oh my God, the cables and the adapters. <laughs> I've got crates and crates just filled with cables and small equipment. Probably more than I need, <laughs> I have to admit. But it's always there. And then if I need something, I can go to my carefully organized stuff and I find what I need most of the time. So I'm proud about that. I get that from my mother. She was very organized. <laughs> if, if you were with me right now in this room, you would be rolling your eyes. It doesn't look very organized to me. Oh, moving day. Then, of course, had to have trouble with AT&T. Didn't have internet through the whole weekend. Supposed to have it hooked up Friday around noonish. And that didn't happen. <laughs> oh, we're having some troubles. Look, look, looks like it's not going to happen. They were supposed to deliver the uh, new modem. I needed a new modem for this particular move I was making. So they said, okay, we'll have it delivered by uh, Friday for sure. You'll have it. It's, it's real easy. It's a self-install. Okay. Of course, it doesn't show up. Doesn't show up. Doesn't show up. And then I get another call from AT&T saying that your appointment is about to happen. And this is on moving day, which is Friday. So uh, they call me, say, okay, your, your, your tech guy is going to be there for the install. No, I was told it was uh, going to be mailed to me. Well, the information I have here is that uh, a tech is coming. You have an appointment today between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. <laughs> that nice tight window they give you. All right. I said, all right. Well, okay, send them over. I'm here. I'm at the new place. I'm, I'm moving in. Uh, so the guy never shows up, never shows up, never shows up. All right, fine. It's now Saturday. I'm thinking, uh, well, maybe the uh, modem has been delivered via UPS as the first person told me, because now I got, I got conflicting messages coming from AT&T. So I drive over to the old place, which is only a couple blocks away. I'm still in River West, the greatest neighborhood in the world in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I only moved a couple of blocks. So I, I drive over there just to check. Is there a UPS box? Nope, there's not. I come back after running a few errands, come back to the new place. <laughs> I now live on the 21st floor. I love it, by the way. I have a view. Oh, I have, I'm looking at you right now. I can see the whole world from my window. It's so wonderful. I got a beautiful panoramic view of Lake Michigan, the downtown Milwaukee skyline, I can see the Hone Bridge. Oh, it's fantastic. Anyway, much to my surprise, I get off the elevator on the 21st floor, and there is my modem sitting right next to my door, delivered 
to the new address, where it was supposed to be delivered to the old address, according to what they told me. Or the tech guy came while I was gone. I wasn't home, so he just left the uh, modem. I don't know. At this point, I'm really confused. So I come in, I hook up the modem, boom, doesn't work. (laughs) And of course, now it's Saturday night. So I'm not going to get a tech until Monday. So it's a good thing I planned ahead. Something else I got from my mother. I was very smart to plan a repeat program for Monday. Just in case things went hinky. And they did. So I had a program all loaded up and ready to go for Martin over at River West Radio. And it was posted to the appropriate podcast host site. So I had a Monday show ready for you. So you had a, you had a show yesterday because uh, there was no way I was going to be able to create one without the internet. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know how that works. <laughs> Our whole lives shut down. So now it's Monday. <laughs> the string of conflicting calls from AT&T keep coming. And I'm getting texts and I'm getting phone calls. One guy says, yeah, you got to have a tech guy come because something's not working. All right, fine. Well, he's coming between two and four. So make sure you're there. And I'm getting text after text. Are you going to be there? Do you want to keep this appointment? They're confirming two and three times. Another one says, all, all the COVID regulations, if you can't follow these guidelines, then please cancel or, you know, so I'm dealing with this. Two o'clock comes, just before two o'clock comes, another text. Oh, he's running late. 5.15 is now estimated time of arrival. Do you want to keep <laughs> this? Or you want to make a new appointment? All right, I'll keep it fine. That was That was like two o'clock on the dot. Two minutes later, I get a phone call from the guy saying, oh, I'm about 15 minutes away. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he shows up about a half hour later. It's now like 2.30 or so. He's here. He's been working for a while. He has to go down in my basement and <laughs> across the street. I don't know where he's going to make sure everything's all aligned. <laughs> all the stars are aligned with at and I'm not sure what he's doing. So he's now been here and around the building for about 20 minutes when I get a text. Good afternoon. Your at and technician is on the way. See you soon. <laughs> this is after he's been here for 20 minutes. So I don't know. By about, oh, four o'clock, a little before, uh, everything's done. Julian, my technician from at and did a, just a fantastic job. Thank you very much. All is well. The modem is working. I am connected to the world. Oh, what a thing when you're not connected. But right up until the end, I, I kept getting uh, messages from... They got two different worlds over there at at and <laughs> I imagine I'll get another call today. Of, of one kind or another. <laughs> oh, Okay. Now, here's the deal. (laughs) It's nice to have the internet back because, well, mostly so I can speak to you. I mean, that's the most important thing. But there's a certain amount of personal business and entertainment that you also get from the internet, especially now since I have no television. Now, you and I have spoken many times about you know how I feel about television. I'm against all forms of pay television, all sorts of streaming, paywalls, Cable and satellite, of course, those are dinosaurs that I would never consider. And television in general, it's mostly crap. (laughs) I don't care if people call this the golden age. It's still just TV. Back in the old days, nobody cool ever admitted they watched television. Now everybody can't wait to tell you about their favorite binge. I don't understand what happened to, to television. Trust me, it didn't get any better. Occasionally... I will find my way to something that people are raving about. They tell me, oh, you absolutely have to see Shit's Creek. You just have to see it. And uh, it turns out that it's now in syndication on one of the free channels. So I watched it because people were just going nuts over this show. Okay. All right. I'll check it out. You guys, it's just television. It's just all just television. Nothing has changed in 60 years. It's all just television. It's all just crap. So, (laughs) you know me. We've talked about this. I watch occasional, you know, I watch a Packer game on a Sunday. I mostly just sort of watch news and 
Uh, if, if I really need to veg out on the couch, I'll just flip around and find, you know, an old rerun or something. I don't care, you know, but, uh, in my new place here, I get no reception with my digital antenna. I, I, I I scan, I've scanned about 50 times since I've been here in the last three days. I'll scan. And every time it comes up something different, I'll get about, I don't know, 15 channels and most of them are shopping channels. Thankfully, I still have PBS. I, you know what? PBS scans. So I think I'm fine. That's really all I need. Uh, PBS is fantastic. Uh, but <laughs> I noticed what I did get was this game show network. I think it's called Buzzer. I got that. I got a whole bunch of shopping channels and some channel that keeps showing the Beverly Hillbillies. So I can watch the Beverly Hillbillies or <laughs> Match Game <laughs> with Gene Rayburn. Remember that one? Uh, pretty much 24-7. If I want to sit down and watch the Match Game with Charles Nelson Riley. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, they're on. They're just on all the time. So I, you know, for a, for a second there, just for a fleeting moment, I thought, well, am I gonna have to just eat crow here and actually pay for television? Because I'm not getting any local stations. I'm not getting any local news. The basic network affiliates where I get my local news, nothing, nothing. It's all these little weird channels <laughs> that I never heard of. Um, one time I scanned, I was getting a clear signal from Chicago for some reason. I said, oh, okay, okay. What's, what's going on here? I'm on the 21st floor facing south. So yeah, Chicago's coming in, but three blocks north of me are the WTMJ studios, channel four, and, uh, they're completely dark. They're gone. <laughs> so I thought, all right, well, am I going to pay? No, that idea of it came and went pretty quickly. So uh, if I need to veg on the couch, I'm just going to watch uh, Betty White and uh, who's the guy who sat in the middle? What's his name? Oh, Dawson, Richard Dawson. <laughs> what a creep this guy is. I, I watched I watched a few episodes and uh, this happened more than once. When they bring on a new contestant, the set kind of uh, turns on itself. It wheels around to reveal the new contestant. And traditionally, the host, Gene Rayburn, will talk very briefly with the new person. Just tell us about yourself. Oh, I'm so-and-so. I'm a housewife from Burbank or whatever. And, and this happened a couple of times. If that contestant is a young, traditionally attractive woman, like especially traditionally attractive, while she's telling her about herself... They will cut to Richard Dawson leering at her. Oh, the 70s. Oh, the 70s. So creepy. It's just so creepy. Yeah, if, if, if you have any sensitivity at all toward misogyny, sexism, you don't want to sit and relax with Match Game 74 or 75 or 76. Uh, the host, Gene Rayburn, had this little tradition where they would change celebrities once a week. Uh, there's six celebrities on this program. Uh, everybody has seen match game, right? You're familiar with this. <laughs> Go ahead. Admit it. You know what match game is. <laughs> Panel of six celebrities helping the uh, contestants win fabulous prizes. So there's th I have three regulars, I believe, and then three who kind of rotated in and out. And one of them was always a starlet. A, a beautiful TV or movie star. And Gene Rayburn would make a big production out of spritzing some mouthwash into his mouth before he gave her a big kiss. Oh, she's the new, she's the new beautiful star. I have to give her a big kiss. And it was just so gross and so horrible. So last night, just before I'm about to go to bed, I'm watching a little match game because <laughs> I've had quite a weekend. And on comes this monstrosity, this madness called supermarket sweep have you ever heard of this it looks like it looks like an 80s kind of a thing early mid 80s man something very particular about an 80s game show they are wild and they have rules just all these odd weird rules you can't understand and the look the look is very strange 
Oh, the hairstyles. Never in my experience more experimentation with hairstyles as in the early to mid 80s. That hair was flying everywhere on both men and women. You never knew what you were going to see next. And what's going on with the sweaters? Everybody in the 80s was wearing sweaters all the time. Was it cold in the 80s? Was it just always cold? Was there some, I was around in the 80s. I don't remember exactly. Was, was, was there some sort of global weather event that made it cold all the time? <laughs> oh, but this, yeah, supermarket sweep was insane. It happens, it happens in an actual grocery store. I mean, in a real grocery store with aisles and aisles, it's huge, aisles and aisles of food. And uh, they have to run around with their grocery carts and they have to jam them full of groceries. And I'm not sure what's going on. And there are these little specials everywhere. They get bonuses for grabbing those. And there are so many convoluted rules that I, I really have no clue as to what they're doing, except that it's madness. Yeah, supermarket sweep. Never seen that before. That one was new to me. The host was wearing a very nice sweater, though. Uh. So the move and the organization continues here. And when I just have to sit down and rest my weary brain, I've got uh, Match Game and the Beverly Hillbillies always waiting for me. Well, doggies. <laughs> No, Beverly Hillbillies has no lasting power at all. That's that's one of many programs that I watched as a kid that just don't hold over. <laughs> you just can't you just can't watch some things as an adult. All right. Well, so much has happened since last we spoke. <laughs> I guess one of my favorite little moments was last night as I'm watching uh, the news hour. Like I say, I still get PBS. Thank goodness. That's really all I need. They break in with uh, with news. Oh, Yamichelle Sindor is back with breaking news. Well, as you all know now, the, uh, the GSA, General Services Administration, and the chief administrator here, Emily Murphy, they've been holding out on this uh, paperwork they have to sign off on to allow President-elect Joseph Biden to have access to the funds and logistics and office space, things like that, to get the transition going. Typically, normally, this is something none of us have ever heard of. It happens sort of automatically. As soon as the election is called and everyone knows who, you know, all the AP and everybody calls it, everybody knows it's a done deal, then the GSA just signs off on a little form, says, okay, you're the president-elect. Get the transition going. Here's all the funding. Here's the office space. Here are the keys. Have a good time. And we never even really hear of this. It's not news. It's just something that happens. Well, we heard of it this time because this Emily Murphy person, who I'm not liking very much <laughs> the more I read about her, well, she decides to dangle the keys in front of Joe for about, well, when was election? It's been three weeks since the election. There's really been no doubt at all since a, a day or two out it took a day or two, but we all knew that it was Joe. And then finally on that Saturday, the AP called it. So now we all know. And still, she doesn't hand over the keys. What's going on? Well, of course, the Orange Menace continues with his ridiculous lawsuits and threats. And so she's buying into this, I guess. She claims up and down, but nobody believes her that she wasn't pressured at all. But now in the latest couple of decisions, especially that, that one, that was so great. Or the judge, what was the phrase he used? The, the Frankenstein's monster to describe this weird legal argument that Giuliani tried to sew together. <laughs> Actually used the term Frankenstein's monster. I love it. So with these last couple of defeats, I mean, literally dozens, literally dozens of court cases just tossed out on their ear. Finally, finally, she gives in. Might have had something to do with the very threatening letter she got from Congress saying, man, you got to do this. So she hands over the keys. But here's what just, I just loved. Moments after the letter was reported, the Orange Menace tweets, I want to thank Emily Murphy at GSA for her steadfast dedication and loyalty to our country. She has been harassed, threatened, and abused. And I do not want to see this happen to her, her family, or employees of GSA. 
Our case strongly continues. We will keep up the good fight. Man, his syntax is just bizarre. And I believe we will prevail. Exclamation point. Yeah, he's still... Lord mercy. Okay, here, here now. Nevertheless, part two of the tweet. In the best interest of our country, I am recommending that Emily and her team do what needs to be done with regard to initial protocols and have told my team to do the same. So he's somehow taking credit for what? Giving permission? Encouraging her? Allowing her? He thinks he makes this happen? No, she's independent. She could have made the decision at any time. And she did finally make the decision. And as soon as she did, and he found out about this letter, he fires off this tweet, making it look like he made it happen. And damn it, if some of the news outlets didn't fall for it. I saw some headlines that said that the Orange Menace made it happen. If that's the impression you're getting, because I've seen media that's saying it or certainly implying it. Yeah, she had authority to do this at any time. She could have done it a couple of Saturdays ago when all the rest of us were dancing in the streets and honking our horns, but she chose not to because she was buying into this whole fraud in the election thing or whatever. She was buying into the orange menace and his delusional case. Certainly I'm sure being threatened or pressured either through back channels or if he gave her a call himself, which we'll probably find out someday that they spoke. She denies it, of course. Oh, and this harassment that the Orange Menace is referring to comes from the actual letter. Now, let's, let's get into some of this. I'm not a fan of this person, this Emily Murphy person. No, no. Let me read you the letter she wrote that prompted the Orange Menace's tweet. November 23rd, 2020, the Honorable Joseph R. Biden, Jr. Dear Mr. Biden, Section 7 of the Act and Public Law 116159, dated October 1, 2020, which provides continuing appropriations until December 11, 2020, makes $6,300,000 available to you to carry out the provisions of Section 3 of the Act. In addition, $1 million is authorized pursuant to Public Law 116159 to provide appointee orientation sessions and a transition directory. I remind you that Section 6 of the Act imposes reporting requirements on you as a condition for receiving services and funds from GSA. If there is anything we can do to assist you, please contact Ms. Mary D. Gilbert, the Federal Transition Coordinator, sincerely Emily W. Murphy, Administrator, U.S. General Services Administration. That was the last paragraph. That wasn't the whole letter. Should have been. Should have been the whole letter. Nope. Nope. That was the final paragraph of one, two, three, four, five paragraphs, which she spends most of her time whining and complaining about how hard her job is and how everybody was giving me a bad time and people were being mean to me. I've dedicated my life to public service. I've always strived to do what was right. Please know that I came to my decision independently based on the law and available facts. I was never directly or indirectly pressured by any executive branch official, including those who work at the White House. I did, however, receive threats online, by phone, and by mail directed at my safety, my family, my staff, and even my pets in an effort to coerce me into making this determination prematurely. Even in the face of thousands of threats, I always remained committed to upholding the law. Contrary to media reports, I'm not going to read this whole thing. She goes on and on and on, just whining and complaining, bitching and moaning about how everybody was so mean to her. This is an, this is an incredible letter to the president-elect of the United States. I do not like this woman. I don't know anything about her. I looked her up on Wikipedia. And, uh, you know, she's a lawyer. This is what she does. This kind of administrative stuff. Apparently she knows what she's doing. She's qualified. But uh, early in her career, she started with the uh, Republican National Committee. Worked for the RNC as assistant to the director of administration from, let's see, 95 through 97. Staffer for Republican House member Jim Talent. Chair of the House Committee on Small Business. So she comes up through the Republican ranks, the RNC, the Republican side of the aisle in uh, the House, and then various sort of positions in administrative stuff. So 
she appears qualified. I'm not saying she's not qualified, but I don't believe she <laughs> didn't give in to pressure. There is some history of this. One other moment when she makes the news, and that was a couple of years ago, in 2018, uh, 2018, you might remember there was this little flack about the J. Edgar Hoover building in Washington, D.C. Murphy became involved in a dispute surrounding a decision to cancel plans to relocate the J. Edgar Hoover building out of Washington, D.C., instead planning to do a more expensive rebuild at the existing location. They're planning to move out of Washington, and the idea that that might be turned into a luxury hotel and Trump didn't want that, of course, because he didn't want the competition. So there was a little Washington court intrigue about that. Well, Murphy was part of those congressional hearings of 2018. And subsequently, a GSA inspector general report showed that her testimony, quote, left the misleading impression that she had no discussions with the president or senior White House officials in the decision-making process about the project. So... She didn't disclose her meeting with the president on two occasions about that project. And then another one with his chief of staff, who was John Kelly at the time. So she lied or misled about the very thing they're asking now. Well, did you have pressure? Did you have meetings? No, no, I didn't. But people were mean to me. <laughs> so it's so, Joe, you got your cash. You got your keys. You got your offices, go to it. And then I just love that the Orange Menace fires off this tweet right after the letter becomes, uh, somebody got hold of the letter. I think CNN, somebody got hold of the letter. And then he fires off the tweet, <laughs> claiming credit and uh, reinforcing and amplifying her whining session. People are mean to me. It is kind of disturbing that she got the threats and I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to see what she got, actually. I don't know. I, I always discourage the, uh, both sides type arguments. But if she got any actual like menacing, threatening letters from the left, don't do that, you guys. Don't do that. Right wingers will always do it. But uh, we shouldn't do that. Let's not make a both sides argument for them on that. And if you did it, shame on you. Don't do that. Well, as always, when we haven't spoken for a couple of days, there's a lot to catch up on. I will say this, though. If you planned to travel or spend time with your family on Thanksgiving, extended family, uh, change your plans. Not too late. Thanksgiving with immediate household only. Otherwise, you're being terribly irresponsible and contributing to catastrophic levels of the transmission of this virus. Please, I'm begging you. Immediate household only for Thanksgiving. Not too late to change your plans if, if you were planning on breaking the rules. Please, please. All right. Wish me luck on tackling all these uh, boxes and <laughs> unpacking and organizing I have to do here. It's, it's actually kind of fun, I guess. At the moment, it looks a little daunting, but I'll do it. I love you. Talk to you tomorrow. I'm Charles Purcell.